Aldrich, William swings, and there's a long drive to deep right. That ball is going, and it is gone. A home run for Ted Williams in his last time at bat of the major league. When legendary left fielder Ted Williams retired after the 1960 season, interest in the Red Sox in the New England region faded. It wasn't that there was no more Ted. It was that the Red Sox were flat out bad. The decline actually began in 1959. The Sox had 11 winning seasons in between 1946 and 1958, but in 1959, the team finished in fifth place, and in 1960, seventh. And then things got worse. Six straight losing seasons in between 1961 and 1966, and they hit their low mark in 1965 and 1966. Going into 1967, the Red Sox had won exactly one pennant since the end of World War I. That was in 1946, and they lost in, uh, the World Series in seven games uh, to the Cardinals. You had an owner, Tom Yawkey, who it sounded like had grown weary of trying to win in Boston. Made a lot of noise about needing a new ballpark, and if he didn't get a new ballpark, uh, was contemplating moving the team out of town. Prior to 1967, there were paid attendances of less than 600 fans. There were barely 8,000 people on opening day. And the second game drew a paltry 3,600. The Red Sox needed to be re-energized by something, by anything. It started in Game 3, Red Sox-Yankees, Friday, April 14th, the Yankees' home opener, rookie Billy Roar's debut. Dick Williams, who loved to play hunches, that's Billy Rohr in his first game in the major leagues as the pitcher. Top of the ninth, Tom Trash hits a ball deep to left center field. Yastrzemski makes one of the great catches in, in team history, uh, which temporarily preserves the no-hitter. Next thing you know, it's the ninth inning, and Billy Rohr is throwing a no-hitter. <laughs> in fact, with, with two outs, Elston Howard uh, singled in right field and, and, and broke it up. But... You know, it's sort of like losing the World Series. Yeah, they lost the no-hitter, but you can't imagine that. A, a rookie pitcher <laughs> almost pitched a no-hitter. So people started to pay attention then. The Sox won the game, but lost the next three in a row. They finished April with an 8-6 and six record. The Red Sox were a streaky team in the first half of the season. They had three separate four-game winning streaks and five separate three-game losing streaks. On July 13th, they were in fifth place six games out of first place. Their record was 42-40, and 40. and then a 10-game winning streak. It's Sunday afternoon, late afternoon, they've won the second game, and on the radio the announcers said, for the Red Sox wives and anybody else who might be meeting the players, we're expecting in a Logan about 9.30, and they'll be coming into the American Airlines terminal, and about 10,000 PNs spontaneously said, hey, Let's go out and welcome them home. The bombing at Logan Airport after the 10-game winning streak, what, what was that like? Uh, we came back home to Boston. Uh, we were at Logan Airport, and the pilot announced that there were a lot of fans uh, on the tarmac that we were going to have to divert to another part of the, uh, the airport, uh, which was pretty unusual. We'd get off the plane and, and get on buses, and there's thousands of people uh, waiting to... Uh, just congratulate us and cheer us on and uh, tell us how much they appreciate it. And I think that uh, once we got off of that road trip and having won 10 in a row, uh, that was uh, the moment where we knew we had a chance to win this thing. We had no idea, you know, the, these, uh, these folks were, st were starving for a winning ball club and a ball club with personalities. And you had guys like Yaz having a great year and Tony C having a great year. And, um, you know, rookies, Mike Andrews, Joe Foy, George Scott, uh, players that Dick O'Connell brought in, uh, you know, to uh, improve the, the strength of the team. Um, it was just such that it was the coolest feeling because no one ever, ever expected that to happen. The captain announced uh, that there was a lot of people there to greet us. He said something like 10, 15,000. So they were going to bring us off. They were going to uh, get a bus, which they did, and uh, take us to avoid the, 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 you know, the fans. And we said, wait a minute, they're here to see us. How can we do that? 
So we went through, you know, the baggage claim and all that stuff, and the fans were just fabulous. Little kids, it was late at night, you know, they had their kids on their shoulders, hey, there's Yaz, you know, it was, it was really fun. It was, uh, and it was important to, to not only the fans, but uh, to the city of Boston. Bill Crowley was a public relations director at the time, and, and he was listening to the game, and when he heard the announcement, he, he said to himself, boy, I wonder if a whole lot of people... So he called the state police at Logan and said, I think you ought to keep an eye out. I think there could be a, a big mob. And they laughed and said, uh, for the Red Sox, oh, yeah, right, okay, I think we're, you're overreacting a little. We handle the Beatles, so we're not at all worried. And the next thing they knew, the 10,000 people in total chaos. <laughs> it was like a, a baseball Woodstock. Everybody was so nice, you know, perfectly fine place that you could have a babe in arms. Everybody, hey, isn't this wonderful, you know? Uh, and people were just pulling over the curb and, <laughs> and parking their car and getting out and running around. The Red Sox had both power and pitching. American League MVP Carl Yastrzemski had a season for the ages, winning the Triple Crown with 44 home runs, 121 RBIs, and a 326 batting average. And the Sox scored the most runs of any team in the American League. And Jim Lomborg won the American League Cy Young with 22 wins and 246 strikeouts. It seemed that regardless of what the Red Sox needed in a particular moment, whether it was a base hit, a home run, a great catch, a great throw, invariably Yaz came up with it. And, and I mean, the greatest testament to that, of course, is his performance down the stretch. You know, last three weeks of the season, Yaz goes 23 for 44, hits over 500. The last weekend of the season, when the Sox have to beat the Minnesota Twins uh, twice, uh, in order to even have a chance at winning the pennant, Yaz goes seven for eight, hits a three-run home run in in the penultimate game, game 161, and then hits a tie, uh, uh, tying game-tying two-run single in the final game of the season when the Sox were down two nothing, entering the sixth inning. So it was uh, it was Yaz. It was all about Yaz. War is is a is is a newer metric you know, wins above replacement. But the only player who ever had a higher war for a single season than Carl Yastrzemski did in that year, and I believe his was 12.4, was Babe Ruth. It had been over a decade since the Sox last had a winning record. New Englanders were dying for a winning ball club. Sox fans couldn't contain their excitement. The whole region, not just Boston, but the whole New England region, was on board with it and um, you know so cars started to show up with stickers promoting the team you never saw that before um, certainly the radio broadcasts were you know very much a part of the soundtrack of that entire summertime I mean it is true and you know you hear this you think maybe it's a cliche but it's not I mean if you were at the beach on a summer afternoon you could walk like a mile or two in places like Ogunquit, Maine, and you'd hear the broadcast as a continuum. It wouldn't break up because everyone had the radios out, you know, and this was in the pre-headphone days. Folks would have the radios turned up so that everyone could hear it. There's the famous story of the cab driver refusing to enter the Callahan Tunnel because it was, a, it was at a critical juncture in the game and he wanted to see if the Red Sox were going to score. It caused, single-handedly caused a traffic jam. Uh, and the Red Sox did score and they did go on to win that game. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a tremendously unifying thing. Everybody talked about the Sox and, and uh, um, yeah, there, there, there was... There was almost an innocence about it, I think, because um, it was so unexpected and, and that it actually came to fruition and they won. 
I mean, that was beyond your wildest dreams at that point. Starting with the 10 game winning streak, the Sox went 50 and 30 down the stretch. Entering the final weekend of the season, the Red Sox and Tigers were tied in second place and both trailed the Minnesota Twins by one game. The Red Sox opponent that weekend, the Twins. If the Sox won both Saturday and Sunday, they would be American League champions. They won on Saturday 6-4 to four, thanks to the Aziz's four RBIs, and on Sunday, the Sox won 5-3, to three, with the Red Sox scoring five runs in the sixth inning, thanks to two wild pitches and one error by the Twins, to overcome a 2-0 deficit, ultimately winning 5-3. to three. On Sunday, with the Sox leading 5-3 to three and nobody on base, with two outs in the ninth inning, Minnesota's Rich Rollins hit a short pop-up right to Rico Petroselli at shortstop for the final out. But at that point, the Red Sox only clinched a tie for the division. They had to wait for the Tigers to lose. And once the Tigers did lose, the Red Sox, who before the season were 100-1 to long shots to win the pennant, did just that. Would you say that Red Sox Nation really took off after the 1967 season? I, I, I know exactly uh, what you mean because they, <clears throat> they talk about uh, Red Sox Nation now and I, I think that historically uh, if you were thinking about a moment in time uh, where that, uh, that statement um, came to um, being part of how people feel about uh, the Red Sox uh, we lit the spark, uh, you know, that turned out to be a, a huge fire, a, a passionate fire about uh, the Boston Red Sox and the history of the Red Sox and the players uh, in the Red Sox. Uh, we were the ones that started uh, the feeling that there was something special going on here in New England now. 1967 changed everything in, in, in terms of, of the interest level. Uh, as I said, their attendance doubled. Uh, in 67 to 1.75 million uh, and within 10 years they were up to 2 million and then if you realize eight years later in 1975 when you had the, the Gold Dust Twins and, and uh, Freddie Lynn and Jim Rice and that great team that won the American League pennant and then had uh, uh, the epic World Series uh, match against the Cincinnati Reds, the big red machine and uh, a series that included what many people arguably say was the greatest World Series game ever played, the Game 6 uh, that the Sox hit won with Carlton Fisk homering off the left field foul pole. Uh, you know, so all the subsequent teams after 67 built on the popularity of that team. Um, and, you know, not coincidentally, uh, you know, dovetailed with uh, a, a spike in the team's performance, too. I mean, particularly, uh, you know, from the early 70s on, uh, yes, the Red Sox only won a handful of pennants. I mean, 75, 86, uh, they went to the playoffs in 88, 90, lost, 95, they lost. Uh, it wasn't until uh, 2004 they went to the World Series again. But they were, it was a much different situation than, say, a Cleveland that was a perennial also ran. The Red Sox were competitive teams uh, from that point on. The Red Sox rattled off 12 straight seasons of above 500 baseball after 67. And since the Impossible Dream season, the Red Sox have only had nine losing seasons compared to 12 winning seasons. Even though the Sox lost to the St. Louis Cardinals in seven games in the World Series, there's been a love affair between Red Sox fans and the Red Sox ever since.